Hey brewers, welcome to The Real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own channel. Uh, we're here to provide home brewing guidance and tips, and we're gonna be equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Josh Ratliff, I'm a BJCP certified beer judge, the brewmaster for Mr. Beer, and I'm also store manager at Everything Homebrew in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, today we're going to be brewing our shillelagh stout recipe. Um, this is a recipe uh, which is not to be confused with a refill. Um, our refills are just our basic um, cans, usually with a liquid malt extract for the deluxe or the booster with the standard. What makes the recipes different is that it's, it's usually a, the can of malt extract and sometimes um, extra ingredients such as extra hops. Um, um, we have partial mashes, which use a little bit of grains in them, and we'll, we'll be brewing some of those in later shows. Um, and they'll also have uh, some of our, our recipes even include two or even three cans in one two-gallon batch, which makes a really high alcohol beer, such as our Novocaine, which is a barley wine, and our Lock, Stock, and Barrel um, Bourbon Barrel Aged Stout. Okay, with that said, uh, the Shillelagh Stout recipe is a 4.7 star review on our website. Um, it's about 4.2%, which is which is average for um, the standard um, Irish style stouts. Um, American style stouts will, will tend to be much higher in alcohol, but uh, Irish stouts like your regular Guinness is typically about 4.2 to 5%. Um, this has an SRM of 40. SRM means standard reference method. This is the way brewers uh, figure out the color of a beer. Uh, 40 is very high. Um, beyond 50 is pretty much black. So this might, at 40, it'll, you'll still be able to see a little bit of light through it. Um, it's at about 50 IBUs, um, which would seem kind of high. IBUs are the international bitterness units that tells how bitter a beer is. Um, 50 does seem kind of high for a stout, but with the, um, the sweetness of the malts, it kind of balances out. So the perceived bitterness is lower than what you would think 50 IBUs would be. Um, this is similar to uh, Guinness, Dra Guinness Draft or Murphy Murphy's Irish Stout. Uh, Guinness Draft being the most popular stout in the world. It's basically the grandfather of all stouts. Um, and we'll get to a little bit of history of the, of the stout later. The uh, standard shillelagh stout recipe contains one can of malt extract with the yeast under the lid. Um, some of our recipes, like I said, if they come with a special yeast, you won't be using the yeast under the lid. So you'll want to set that aside for another batcher or, or whatever you want to use it for. Um, it also comes with one pack of our smooth dry malt extract. So we're going to actually be showing you how to use dry malt extract properly today. Um, this is different than liquid malt extract. This, is, this has almost all the water removed, so it has a little bit higher shelf life, but it can be a little more difficult to use. But I'll show you how that's done later. Um, it also includes the no rinse sanitizer, as all of our recipes do. And this also includes a pack of Northern Brewer hops. This is a German um, hop that we're gonna be using today and uh, a muslin sack for the hops. You don't necessarily have to use a muslin sack, but it will prevent your spigot from clogging up. All right, so the DME is gonna add um, flavor, body, and some alcohol. Uh, it'll bring it up about 1% per package. Um, this is the amber DME as opposed to pale or robust. So this is gonna add some kind of toffee caramel notes, which is desirable in stouts because they are more malt forward than, than hop or yeast forward beers. All right, first thing we're gonna do is take off the top, our lid, so this one. I got this old, we just got a new can opener I'm excited about, but I still like using this one for that little pointy end. So you can bust the lid like that. It makes it much easier to get off. These lids are on really tight so that the, the yeast packet will stay in place. And go ahead and discard that. And I got a container here to fill with hot water. And the purpose of this is just to soften the extract up a little bit so that it uh, comes out of the can much easier. Okay, while we're waiting for that to heat up, we can go ahead and uh, get started on sanitizing. 
All right, so you're gonna be using half of the no rinse cleanser. I'll grab my scissors. Yeah, sugar fungus. I forgot my shirt with all the pins. I'm sorry. I'll try to have it tomorrow. <laughs> What's difficult about DME, <clears throat> you'll see in a moment when uh, we put it into the, uh, the water, um, how much it clumps up and uh, can cause boil overs, um, as Miniota just said. What yeast benefits stouts the most? That kind of depends on um, um, the beer, the stout you're making. There are several dip different types of stouts, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, but for Irish stouts, typically you want an English or Irish um, or even Scottish yeast. Something from the UK will benefit the best. They tend to bring out more of the malt flavors while muting more of the hop flavors. If you've done an American uh, stout, um, using an American uh, yeast will sometimes give it a little bit more balance or bring out more of the uh, American hops. All right, let's get some water in this guy. First thing I want to do, like I want to do for most of you guys, is show you how this spigot goes on because it's a very common question and people lose their batches all the time by not doing this correctly. So you want to make sure the washer goes on the flat end against the spigot, the tapered end against the wall of the keg. Every time. You don't want to put the spigot on the inside, it will not work, and you don't want to turn the spigot around, it will not work. Go ahead and finger tighten this. Do not use any tools or over tighten it. You can break the spigot by doing that. Or it'll make it very difficult to come off and you do have to remove it every after every batch to clean it. All right, do a little water test. Typically you want to water test for like 30 minutes to an hour or so. Um, we've already pre-tested these, so I'm just making sure uh, the spigot's on tight enough. Doing a little short water test here. And it's good and dry, so go ahead and finish filling that up to the number one marker on the back, which is going to be one gallon. If you have our older uh, little brown pigs, that'll be the uh, four and a half quarter mark. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and use half of the no rinse cleanser. If you want, you can split it up equally or you can just kind of eye it. It doesn't necessarily have to be exact. You want to save the other half for your bottles when it comes bottling time. And we will do a bottling episode, episode here eventually once our first batches from the first shows are done fermenting. Should be in a couple of weeks. Though we might try to do something a little sooner just to kind of show how it's done. Okay, so put your lid on, and I want to point out these two notches at the top. These allow CO2 to escape during fermentation. We've had people call in saying their keg is leaking from the top when they do the, the cleaning or the sanitizing, and it's supposed to. It's not supposed to be airtight, otherwise it could explode during fermentation. So that's to allow CO2 to escape. With that said, you're going to want to have it over a sink when you're shaking this so it doesn't make a big mess because it will leak out, as you can see. And you want to do that about 20, 30 seconds or so. Actually, let me go ahead and shake that a little bit more because it's still kind of solid in there. run a little bit through the spigot so that the spigot is sanitized and then you go ahead and pour the rest or however much will fit into your bowl. This is to sanitize the tools. The whisk doesn't necessarily need to be sanitized um, but we're using the spoon and our can opener. And I'll throw some scissors in there too because you want you want your scissors to be sanitized when they open the yeast. Dump out the rest of 
of this. Now this is a no rinse cleanser, as the package says, so you do not need to rinse it. It is a food grade product and will not hurt you in uh, very small amounts. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get this in the in the hop sack here. Let's move this out of the way. And with your scissors, open up your hop sack. I actually like to use a little bowl. This will help collect any of the any of the hop dust in case they're kind of powdery. You want to tie these loosely just at the top because you want the hops to be free in there and not too, too compact, otherwise they're not as efficient. You won't get as much flavor out of them. It's right at the top. Cut off any excess, toss that. And we'll set that aside for right now. Okay. Now water, we're not doing a booster today, so we're just going to add four cups of water and get it boiling. We do use uh, reverse osmosis filtered water. Down here we have filters on all of our faucets here at Mr. Beer. I recommend using um, filtered water or spring water. Um, uh, try to stay away from distilled water as it can lack nutrients your um, your beer needs unless you're unless you're getting more advanced and building an actual water profile just use regular spring um, spring water um, your tap water may be okay if it's if it's okay to you, for you to drink um, a lot some some cities put a little bit too much uh, um, too much chlorine chlorinase and other things in there that can that can that can cause really bad off flavors to your beer so stick with spring water or filtered water Okay, while that is doing its thing, go ahead and talk a little bit about, about Irish stouts. <clears throat> so, um, according to the BJCP, which is the Beer Judge um, Certification Program, this is the program uh, people go through to become beer judges, and they have uh, what's called their BJCP Style Guidelines, which are updated about every, every few years or so. The most current uh, copy is the 2015 Guidelines, um, which has just been uh, linked into the chat. That will open a PDF up and you can go ahead and check, check it out. Um, so Irish Stouts, in fact, let me go ahead and look up the category for that really quick so I don't remember off the top of my head. <clears throat> so this is an Irish Stout, this is, um, Irish stouts were some of the first stouts. They were originally, um, so in Ireland they wanted to, to brew uh, um, a port, like porters, like from the UK and Scotland um, in the early 1800s. They ended up using a little bit more malt than normal, a little, little more roasted malt, um, so it made it a stouter kind of porter is what uh, Guinness billed it as when it first came out. And that's where the word was coined. Um, so what I have here, uh, let me see, pull through the best stuff here. So it's gonna be a black beer with pronounced roasted flavor, much roastier than uh, um, porters. One of the main differences between a porter and a stout, which we will have a blog post about that too, um, is that uh, porters are gonna be a little bit lighter in body. Uh, they don't use as much roasted malt, if any. So they're gonna be more on the uh, uh, caramel side of things, whereas uh, Irish stouts will be more on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the roastier side of things. Um, they are fairly balanced. They can be kind of bitter from the roasted malt and uh, some of the hops. Um, Irish stouts are typically very dry, um, though if you are in the Cork area, 
of Ireland, they can be a little sweeter because they use a little less roasted malt and more caramel malt than the uh, Dublin t style stouts such as Guinness, um, which can be bitter, uh, more bitter and dry due to the roasted malts. An Irish extra stout, which I'm sure you've seen Guinness has their, their draft and then their extra stout, um, is basically the same thing as the draft, but it's higher alcohol, typically 6% or higher. Um, and as far as other stouts goes, then there's uh, sweet stouts, also known as milk stouts. So those are common in the UK. They're called milk stouts or sweet stouts because they use lactose sugar in the production of them, which adds a creamy body and a lot of extra sweetness. Um, we have one of those, our Angry Bovine Chocolate Milk Stout is a really great recipe on our website. It's a good example of that style. Um, and, and one more stout I'd like to talk about, the, the Russian Imperial Stout, since we're on stouts today. Um, these aren't actually Russian. They're not like made in Russia or invented in Russia. It was uh, uh, one of the kings of England a long time ago, I can't remember, 1700s, I believe it was, um, wanted to uh, uh, gift Catherine the Great uh, some beer and so they made this batch of this really strong beer it had to be really strong because of the transport to Russia they didn't have refrigeration in those days so the extra alcohol and malt and all that made it much stronger for, for the travel kind of like similar how the IPAs were, were created um, and so that's kind of how Irish uh, or Russian Imperial Stouts were, were, were born and back to Irish beers, uh, there's also Irish red ales, and these are um, fairly easy drinking. They're kind of similar to a like an English bitter, like an ESB, though they tend to be a little more red. And they have they usually have a little bit of roasted malt, just enough to add a little uh, subtle roasted note to it. Um, they will have a little bit more coffee, toffee, and caramel sweetness. Um, most American red ales that you taste, or, or red ales in the U.S., are more Americanized, meaning they, they use uh, American hops or a, uh, an American yeast. Um, but there are great examples of, of Irish reds as well. And we do have a couple of reds. Hophead Red on our website is a uh, more of the Americanized style. And then, um, what was the other one? Howling Red? Howling Red, that's right. That would be more of an, uh, more of an Irish style, and the Hop Red is the, the American style. So. Um, okay, looks like we got a boil here. Let's go ahead and turn the heat off for that just for now because we're going to be turning it back on here in a moment. And go ahead and open up our dry malt extract. Grab our whisk and start adding this in. Adding a little bit at a time helps the most. As you can see, it's kind of clumping up a little bit. Whisk really helps break that up. If you're just using a spoon, you're gonna have a hard time. We'll go ahead and just dump the rest of that in there. Some people do not like using DME because of how much it clumps up. And um, later on, I'll be doing some uh, um, some batches that are um, some five gallon batches, big batches that use a lot of DME because there are batches that just use DME. Um, but we'll go over that too. And using a whisk again is always going to be the best. And I want to make sure this is completely dissolved before I turn the heat back on so it doesn't scorch on the bottom any heavier pieces. Um, do you need to get all the clumps out before you put in the LBK? Sugar Fungus asks. Um, probably, I would say yes, uh, especially if you're trying to take a gravity reading. If you don't get those clumps dissolved, your gravity reading is gonna be um, is going to be inaccurate but with that said i mean the yeast will still find the the sugar and consume it and break that down and it will eventually dissolve so i say you don't really have to but it is best practice to make sure all the clumps are gone 
Okay, that looks good. We're gonna bring the heat back on. When you're using DME, you want to really be careful with your boil when you're when you're boiling, doing a hop uh, boil, um, because it can boil over and foam up quite a bit, um, and then it'll eventually stop foaming. This is called a hot break. So if it does foam up, just give it a little stir, and it'll it'll settle back down. Once it starts boiling, then we'll add our hops in and count down five minutes. Get my timer ready here. Okay, I'm getting back to the histories here. Oh, another type of stout I forgot to mention, which is kind of a rare, more rare style. It's called a tropical stout. These are kind of similar to milk stouts, but they don't have um, lactose sugar in them. Instead, they use a high amount of um, caramel malts, and they typically use more... Um, American or Southern Hemisphere hops. Um, a few examples of these are popular, like Dragon Stout from Jamaica um, is, a, is a good example of that. Um, Sheaf Stout, I believe from Australia, is, all, is a, a tropical stout. I could be wrong on that. But they're called tropical stouts because they were popularized mainly by Dragon Stout in, um, in Jamaica. And they're pretty good, but they're, they're hard, it's hard to find uh, um, commercial representations of it in the Josh states. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and that's what happens when you don't pay attention. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and put that on a lower heat. And grab my towel. Okay, there we go. Ah, yes, oatmeal stouts are also really great. Oatmeal stouts can be also kind of on the Swedish side, um, sweet side because of the uh, because of the oatmeal, but they're very creamy and have kind of an oaty flavor. They're one of my favorite styles of stouts, actually. So as you can see, this thing likes to foam up quite a bit. So put it on low until you get the hot break, and that's when it basically when it stops foaming. All those proteins are broken up. Okay, and we'll go ahead and add our hops and start the countdown. So this is, these hops are just going to be in here for five minutes. And this is just to add a little bit of bitterness and flavor. Um, this kind of goes into a hop schedule. A hop schedule is um, the boil. Whenever, So you don't really have to do a hop schedule with our Mr. Beer cans because they uh, have all the bittering hops in them already. But you can always add a little bit more bitterness by boiling for a few minutes. Um, um, or you can not do a boil and just add it at the very end and that'll add mostly just flavor and aroma um, Alternatively, you can dry hop which is adding the hops about a week before uh, uh, Bottling or kegging and that will add a, a big punch of, of flavor and aroma And that's really great for IPAs and pale ales and such you won't see that done often with stouts or anything like that With the exception of maybe the tropical stouts with their southern hemisphere hops Okay, we'll let that boil for five minutes. Can we see an example of a boil over? You just saw one, I think. <laughs> Unless you missed it. But I, luckily, luckily they caught it in time, so. Best way to store hops. Um, freezer, um, airtight container, preferably. Um, keep them in the dark um, if you can, that, that's best. Um, pellet hops can be stored quite a while. Um, loose hops should be kind of compressed and, and frozen and they don't have near the shelf life of pellet hops. Um, then there's um, 
um, oh, what are they called? They're, uh, they're like discs. They're like pucks, like, um, hot plugs. That's what they're called. They're called plugs, but you don't see those too often. Usually it's a half ounce in, in a, in a plug and that's the hop flour is just kind of compressed into a plug and then you add it to the beer. Whereas pelletized hops, they're pulverized and then pelletized. Um, so you actually get, they break up into kind of a powder. So they're a lot more efficient and they're the most commonly used. Will there be recipes like this or partial mashes for the larger fermenter in the future? Yes, we're actually gonna be doing, uh, tomorrow we're gonna be doing a Cooper's um, kit. So that's gonna be a six gallon. Um, it's not gonna be a partial mash. We're just gonna do the sparkling ale, I think. Uh, but we'll, we will be doing partial mashes uh, in the near future, possibly, possibly even as early as next week. We'll probably start with a um, simple Mr. Beer partial mash. Um, we will be doing larger partial mashes and also some all grain demonstrations. Obviously we can't fit five to eight hours of all grain brewing into an hour show. So we're gonna kind of break it down into sections each week. And yeah, you can buy three of the same recipe and use it in the six gallon uh, fermenters. Um, or you can uh, buy, you can buy uh, two and just do four gallons. <laughs> does the sparkling ale have glitter in it? I have seen those new fancy beers online. Fortunately, it does not have glitter in it. I've seen those too and I'm just like, no, no. Okay, you want to... As you can see, it's not foaming in anymore because it passed its hot break. And you may have a little bit of, um, if you're doing a boil for more than uh, five minutes, if you're doing a 10 or 20 minute boil or even higher, you're gonna wanna use a little bit more water. Um, I would say for our kits, you know, use up to eight cups, but no more than eight cups because then once you're putting it in your refrigerated cold water in your LBK, um, and topping it off, it may still be a little bit too warm. I'll make some with glitter and send it to you, just, just for you. <laughs> do the hops grow during the boil? They look bigger. Yes, they do expand, because it is a dry powder that's pelletized really compact, so it will expand out, which is another reason why you don't want to fill your uh, muslin sack too tight. You want to have it nice and loose so that they have that room to expand. And we're up uh, about 30 seconds left into this boil. And I'm going to go ahead and get some water ready. So you're going to fill this up with one gallon of water, which should reach to the uh, one gallon mark on, on the back of the keg. And again, this should be cold refrigerated water, not just straight, straight out of the tap. That way when you're filling this, putting your wort in and topping it off, your final um, temperature will be suitable for the yeast, which is about 65, 70 degrees. All right, we'll go ahead and turn that off. And the way I like to do this, where did I put it there? The way I like to do this, because it can be kind of difficult pouring it with the, because uh, you want the hops to go in there too. I take some tongs. You probably don't need to sanitize because this is all boiled, but I, I do it anyway. Can never be too careful. Just transfer it over into the water. I'm gonna go ahead and pour the rest in my pre-sanitized funnel. You know what I totally forgot to do, guys? I forgot to cook the malt extract. <laughs> That's okay, because this is still nice and hot. I may take a little bit, a minute to uh, do this, but I mean, this kind of shows, you know, if you kind of screw up, you can always fix it. You just gotta stay on top of it. Since this is nice and warm too, it should dissolve pretty quick. And 
you could just pour it right into the wort. So I want to make sure you stir it a lot better. I was wondering why it was so light. I was like, huh, this doesn't look like stout. <laughs> Got so caught up with the, the hot boil. Okay. Try to get as much in there as possible. But for the sake of the show, it doesn't have to be perfect. Now, one of the reasons we do the boiling of the four cups of water is mainly just to so that it, it breaks down. So it doesn't even have to be boiled technically, but that's just how we do it in our instructions. Yes, good idea, Minota checklist, which is something I should have been doing on my page here. <laughs> okay, that's nice and dissolved. Okay, now we're gonna top it off to the number two marks. In fact, the less time your, your uh, hot malt extract is exposed to heat, the better. So once you make it and it's hot, you want to get it into that cold water as soon as you can. Don't let it sit. Don't try to cool it or ice bath it. Just get it into that cold water. Oh, that's kind of hard for me to see here. Almost there. Okay, we'll give that another big stir. Um, yeah, that's, you know, you can actually take um, some of the hot wort and use the sanitized, uh, uh, like, cup, metal cup or whatever, um, measuring cup, and, uh, and uh, pour it into the can and just kind of shake it up a little bit if you want. You don't have to get it all out of there, but the, the, if you do, then you're going to be closer to uh, what your uh, um, beginning gravity or your final alcohol by volume will be. I didn't do it so much here because, you know, sake of the show and time and everything. Okay, so the, one of the purposes of stirring that vigorously is to is to aerate the yeast. Um, when they first get started, it's, it's a, an aerobic fermentation, so they do need some oxygen to get going. And then secondary, which would be in your bottle during carbonation, is an anaerobic fermentation where all the oxygen's cut off and then they just create CO2 and, and all your bubbles. But hey, we all make mistakes, so. All right. Go ahead and set this guy aside. Um, if it is still too hot, yeah, an ice bath will be okay if, if initially the LBK, what you put in there, it's, it's still too warm. Um, but if you do the method that I said and you use refrigerated water, which is about 32 to 38 degrees, um, it's going to go to 65, 70 every single time. So an ice bath really isn't necessary unless you forget to use refrigerated water or have no other option. I'm going to scroll up here, see if I've missed any questions, because we're about about towards the end. Uh, water filtered through a Brita OK, or some other type of genetic filter, generic filter. Um, Brita's are, I mean, that's better than nothing. So if you just, if that's all the only way you have to do it, then yeah, go for it. Um, but they don't really filter everything out. Um, they don't always filter out all the chlorinase or anything like that. And I'll get to you here in a second, Mini Yoda. I just want to scroll back up and see if I missed anyone else. Okay, so 
Mini Yoda asks, is there a difference between boiling hops with a muslin sack versus without a sack? The main difference is um, you don't want to clog your spigot. So when using our kits, it's really necessary or recommended to use a, um, a muslin sack to prevent that. Now, one exception would be our new uh, fast fermenters, um, which I can grab one here to show you. And these are really cool fermenters. Um, we have stands for them too, but I'm just going to kind of show you the the fermenter itself so it's got the lid with the airlock on it and then you got a jar here so you don't want to use a muslin sack with these because it will clog this area here and prevent the beer or the trube from going into the collection jar which is intended to um, you know to dump out all that trube and you can actually collect yeast and reharvest it um, one trick so you can since one trick you can do with this since you're removing all of that that stuff is Put your hops inside here if you're just um, if you're not doing a boil. Put them in here and pour your beer on top. That works great. Otherwise, just pour them in to the top um, naked, commando style. And when you're removing the the collection jar after five days or however long the recipe says, um, all that true and those hops will will be in there. So you're gonna you're gonna dump it once, clean it, sanitize it, put it back on. And of course, you're gonna be opening and closing the valve when you do this. Um, to keep it from from dripping out um, and then after a few more days you'll want to you'll want to do it a second time depending on how many hops are in there you might want to do it uh, a third time um, but then once you attach your uh, your other attachment which I'll show you here it's the small ones yes so this guy here attaches and this is for bottling. So it bottles directly from the bottom, but because you removed all of that true, you don't really have to worry about all the hops clogging anything. And even if they do get through here, it's gonna be like the first bottle will have the most true in it, so just set that aside. And everything else should be pretty clear. And most yeast and other particles will, will sit on the side kind of stuck there and won't go anywhere. So these are really great fermenters, I really like them. We do sell those on our website in addition to the 7.9 gallon ones, which you can do nice big high alcohol six gallon batches without worrying about uh, overflowing or anything like that. <coughs> um, so it's called a fast ferment. That's not our name for it. It's the name the manufacturer chose for it. It doesn't actually, it isn't actually faster. Um, it's just more convenient. And yeah, we can brew in that in the future, no problem. I could show exactly how it's used, which I, you know, I plan on doing the three gallon and the 7.9 gallon for some batches in the future. I have a question. Yes, Renee has a question. <laughs> uh, what do I do if I want to look at my beer, but I don't want to infect it? Like, is there a good way or a certain frequency to look at your beer? Um, shining a flashlight into the side is good. You don't, you want to try not to open the lid as much as possible. Um, in case you didn't hear uh, Renee's question, she asked, uh, um, can she open her, her fermenter and look at the beer? What's the best way to look at the beer without infecting it? Best way is just to use a flashlight and look, look directly in there. Um, but as people on our website say, don't perv the beer. That's one of our, our sayings on there. Just, just be patient and let it go. Let it, do, let it do its thing. It's like trying to watch water boil. It's just not going to get you anywhere. So the exception would be when you're adding, um, when you're dry hopping or um, dry adding, I guess you'd call it. You can do it with hops, you can do it with fruit, um, all kinds of different things. Um, the reason you would do that with fruit is because you don't want to add fruit at the beginning of your fermentation because it can, uh, all that sugars, all the sugars get fermented out during that really vigorous uh, fermentation in the first few days. And uh, so it'll leave your beer kind of dry and not really any fruit flavor left over. So you want to add it about two, a week to two weeks before bottling or at least seven days after the primary fermentation because the fermentation is going to be much slower. They're still going to ferment those sugars but at a slower rate which will preserve the flavors of the fruit. Okay. And so when you are adding hops or anything like that into your fermenter, you want to do it quickly. 
you make sure everything's ready, um, like the fruit, make sure it's been, been uh, blended or pulverized or however you're preparing it. Uh, make sure your hops are in a hop sack or however you're adding them and then open the lid quickly put them in and close it. Um, you can use a sanitized spoon to kind of go in there and stir them around so they get completely saturated, but don't stir it too much because you don't want to stir up that true. And another thing I forgot to mention about stirring, um, as you saw I was using a rubber spoon. If you're using a metal spoon and stirring inside your little brown keg, you want to be sure you're not hitting the sides too much or, or scratching it. Um, that goes with cleaning the little brown keg. When you're cleaning it out, make sure you're using a soft cloth and nothing too abrasive like a brush or anything like that because that can cause scratches. Scratches can harbor bacteria. And it's very, very difficult to uh, sanitize them and you typically have to throw them away. Great. Gavsby asks, can I bottle with those hinge cap bottles? Yes, the swing tops, you absolutely can bottle with those. Um, a few notes on those. Um, they're really great for bottling, but um, you do have to replace the rubber seals every so often. And when you're storing them without any beer in them, always store them open. Never store them closed because that's just wear and tear on those seals. And yes, actually, so for people that don't know what, what uh, he's talking about, these are the uh, swing top bottles. And these are excellent to use. People call these Grolsch style bottles because they're the brewery uh, from Germany that was, I think they're German, right? Or are they Dutch or something? I think they're German. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but um, um, yeah, they, these are popularized by the by the by Grolsch beer, and they're really great. I like them. Um, you just you can uh, do long for. Um, aging with these beyond a year but after that um, they may start breaking down the seals so I really recommend using capped beers if you're going to be aging something more than a year. Do they last longer than regular bottles? Um, the glass themselves are much stronger so they are a little bit harder to break. Um, the hinges and everything are really great like I said you just have to replace the the uh, the rubber seals. Um, so I would say they last about the same. I mean, they're just a little, they're a little more sturdy, so they won't break as easily. And these are 16 ounce bottles, by the way. So they're, they're full pint. Are there any beers you wouldn't want to put in there? Any beers I wouldn't want to put in there? Um, not necessarily. I mean, they're really great bottles, especially for, even for like really high carbonated beers, like um, wheat beers and Saison's that can go all the way up to, um, um, uh, okay, so regular beer is about 2.5 um, uh, amount of pressure, and 4.0 is typically the, the the top level for regular beer bottles. These can go a little bit higher. They have a little bit more pressure. So if you're doing like a really effervescent beer um, or cider or something like that, these are great bottles for that. Superboy, it says, awesome that you guys started streaming. My wife just got me a Mr. Beer 2G fermenter. Tonight had been three weeks, and I get to do first taste testing to see if it's ready to bottle. Awesome. What beer did you make, Super? Yes, microfiber towels are great, Mini Yoda. They are the best. Let's see if I missed any of you guys here. The Bohemian Chuck Pilsner, yes, that's a good one. That's also a great beer for um, adding fruits or any any other kind of thing you want to add. All right, so we're probably going to wrap it up here. Um, if anyone has any more questions, get them in the chat now or forever hold your peace. And again, tomorrow we're going to be brewing a... Um, uh, I think we're doing a sparkling ale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to be doing a sparkling ale, uh, six-gallon Cooper's fermenter and uh and we're also going to have a special guest on tomorrow we're going to be talking with uh scott harris he's the uh he's the marketing manager right at cooper's yeah he's the marketing manager at cooper's out of australia um great guy um really fun to talk with really knows his stuff he's going to be talking to us about um about the malt extracts how they're made um and other things like that and uh talking about some of the cooper's kits um, as you may or may not know, Cooper's does own Mr. Beer. They're our parent company. Um, they make all of our malt extracts. They are the world leader in malt extracts and have the best quality malt extract in the world. Um, but they also do their Cooper's extracts, which was their first line um, before they purchased us. But we are the sole supplier of uh, Cooper's in the U.S.
So, uh, Superboy, what time? It's going to be the same time tomorrow. It's going to be 2.30 our time. I believe that's 5.30 Eastern. Um, Arizona does not participate in daylight savings time. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it may be confusing for some of you. In California, it's going to be the same time as here. Cause so, we're, so we're basically on California time until daylight savings hits again. And then we're an hour ahead or something. It's, it's confusing. Okay. Yeah, 4.30 your time. All right, so I guess that's that's it. Um, we're all done here. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or you want to uh, have any suggestions, go to our, um, our community forums. I have a thread on there um, just for this stream, and you can go on there and let us know what you think, uh, anything we think we should do. Um, is it beer 30? Yes, that reminds me, actually. I'll crack this beer before we go. You guys want to try some? Okay. Just some small glasses. So this was brought in by uh, um, my good friend Mark. He's in the Tucson Homebrew Club. Um, this is his plain old Northwest Stout. And he likes to bring in and let me try some of his beers. He's a pretty good brewer. Yeah, do a video of uh, the taste test and bottling and, and, and uh, post it on our forums and we'll, we'll check it out. There's none of the regular taster classes. No. They're in the washer. Oh. This washer. Okay. <laughs> hey, thanks. You don't know me. Four four eight. I don't know you, but thanks. <laughs> um, we're also in the future. We're probably gonna be doing some kind of video game streaming too. I have my own separate channel, and uh, we'll probably host stuff like on here. I like to play a lot of Battlefield One and other games. All right, so let's go ahead and pour some of this stuff for myself, Matt, and Renee. Good idea. I'll do that on this one. More of the Irish stout, but he sees a Northwestern stout. I'm assuming he may have used some Northwestern type hops in it. Oh yeah, that has a great aroma. Mm -hmm. I got some music going. Do we have music going? Shouldn't anymore, we did for a sec there. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, I can't actually hear our stream, so if it comes up, I can't hear it. So let us know if, if you, you can't hear us or it's too loud or whatever. Yeah, this is really roasty. Um, Mm -hmm. Could use a little bit more body, but other than that, it's really nice. Good we're drinking too much. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're drink not drinking enough. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for joining us. Um, again, go to our forums, give us some input. Um, if you haven't already, go to the top and click the follow button because um, we will be having uh, contests and things like that in the future. And if you're following the page, you'll be eligible to uh, participate. Any recommendations for you tonight? Um, are you uh, talking about your um, your tasting video? Super. And this will be the last question, and then I'm shutting off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, just be yourself. Um, when you're tasting, when you're doing a video, you know, make sure you're you're looking at it through the light, the color. Um, get a nice whiff aroma. Don't just like do a little sniff. Put your nose in the glass and really smell it. Close your eyes. Try to smell all the different uh, aromas that are coming over you. Try to point out different aromas, such as um, especially for stouts. You'd want to think of like coffee, chocolate, um, even like licorice. Um, all kinds of different things you can get out of a um, out of the aromas or the flavors. And then tasting. You know, get a get a full swallow. Make sure you do swallow. This isn't wine. We don't we don't dump that stuff. Um, and yeah, so that's that's about it. And sorry guys, you can't do links in the in the chat. Um, unfortunately, I'll try to 
bring that up next time. Um, once we get uh, more people on here and we get uh, some moderation going, we might allow it. But for now, there's no links allowed at this time. If you do want to share a link, go to our community forums and do it there. All right, guys, and everybody, uh, I'll see you tomorrow.